So hi, everyone. Um, welcome to the Trevena Barbara Press reading series. And this year we celebrate 17 years and we published 240 books of poetry, fiction, and translations. So it's a big year for us. And um, I just have a couple of announcements I'd like to make uh, before we start. And uh, that is on July 20th, there will be a triple book launch with my authors, Doug Mathewson, David Capella, and Michael C. Keith. And it will be flash fiction and poetry. On July 27th, we have Kate Gale, managing editor of Red Hen Press, and Pam Yushik, editor of Cutthroat Magazine, and both will be reading from their new books. And then on August 6th, Chervena Barber Press Reads Around the World will host writers from Turkey. Um, so now I'd like to introduce you to our first reader, Anne Bookman. Anne is a poet, anthropologist, and social justice advocate. Her poems have been published in numerous magazines, including Soul Lit, a journal of spiritual poetry, Chronogram, and Dogwood, a journal of poetry and prose just to name a few. In 2012, she published a chapbook, Point of Attachment, with F Finishing Line Press. Her first full collection, Blood Bloodlines, was recently published by Kelsey Books. And I give you in. Can you hear me? OK, great. So thank you, Gloria. Um, it's really an honor to be reading in this series. And congratulations on your anniversary year. Um, Gloria, I want to thank you for your work as a poet, as an editor, as a convener of poets and poetry lovers. Um, I think your work in all three of these areas has been very meaningful in expanding the audience for poetry and building community. And I, I just, I know I'm just one among many who are very grateful for the role that you play. Um, and I want to say it's also an honor to be reading with Jennifer Martelli. Um, Jennifer, I hope we actually get to meet in person someday. Um, so, and thank you for everybody who took the time to be with us. Before I read some poems from Bloodlines, I would like to take a moment to recognize the profound turmoil the profound crisis here it is due to the recent decision by the Supreme Court to ban abortion and women's constitutionally protected right to choose, the gun violence in our communities and schools, the attacks on voting rights, police violence stoked by white supremacy or climate change. As we think about the meaning of the word choice, I think it's important to clearly state that every one of us as a citizen has a choice about whether to speak out, what to say, and how to act in response to these travesties. And I think poetry, especially what poet Carolyn Forche calls the poetry of witness is critically important to us now, maybe more important than ever for understanding our history, for summoning the beauty around us, and for shaping a future based on democracy, equity, and love. Okay, moving on to bloodlines. This book began about 10 years ago. At that time, I had just published a chapbook, Point of Attachment, that explored my deep connection to my mother and the loss of my mother when I was 25. I started writing new poems that were not literally about my mother, but she was always there, hiding in plain sight in the spaces between the words. So I decided to explore those spaces and found them full of memory and meaning. As some of you know, this book is in part about my mother's illness and the gene that increases the chances of Ashkenazi Jewish women getting breast cancer or ovarian cancer, the BRCA gene. My mother, my maternal aunt, and my maternal grandmother were each diagnosed with one of those cancers 
in their 40s, but they did not know they carried the gene. It was only discovered in 1994. There is now life-saving genetic testing that can help carriers create a healthcare plan with regular screenings, but none of this was available to them. My daughter and I both decided to be tested for the BRCA gene. And although we learned that we are both carriers, we are grateful to have access to excellent care and are both healthy. When my mother was diagnosed with breast cancer, not only was she unaware that she carried the gene, but as her cancer metastasized, she was not told. The 1960s was a very different time in terms of open discussion about cancer, and women were often not informed about their illnesses and prognosis. There was silence, silence masquerading as protection. This book examines the impact of that silence, breaks through that silence. It also gives a voice to women who have not gotten sick like myself, but who live in a state of high risk. In a series of six prose poems that start with my maternal great grandmother and end with my daughter, the stories of lives cut short and lives still unfolding are told. In other lyric poems, the mysterious and nonlinear process of moving from gratitude to grief, from, excuse me, from grief to gratitude, from loss to love is explored. I'm going to start with the first poem in the book and introduce you to my great grandmother who lived in the second half of the 19th century. Migration roots. Bloodstreams channel a mystery, personal yet shared, transport a heavy leather trunk, prophetic genes spliced memories uninhabited dreams across the salt slick ocean, unrelenting wave slaps. Invisible navigators confront turbulence, make landfall, set up camp, tents sway, ropes fray, millions upon millions in flow, swim past liberty incognito. No one applied for entrance to my body. Black Satchel. I have only one photograph of Rivka, my grand, great grandmother on my mother's side. She wears a long dark dress, buttons from neck to waist, ruffle of lace covers her throat, wrists. She poses for the camera. The occasion is obscure. Camera obscura, the darkened box, pinhole of light objects partially revealed upside down. Rivka stands alone at a round table, white cloth with long fringe covering the top. On the edge of the table, a black satchel. She holds the handle with her left hand. She works as a midwife in her neighborhood, makes home visits to pregnant women and mothers with infants. This is her medicine bag. She carries alcohol swabs, suturing thread, needles, scissors, and a small silver flask of brandy. Rivka, her husband Solomon, and their two small children landed at Ellis Island in March, 1893. Was this photograph taken before she boarded the Dresden, the steamer ship on which she traveled to America? Or was it taken later when she lived in a tenement on Broom Street in the Lower East Side? Rivka died in childbirth at 30 escaping the illnesses linked to the Ashkenazi gene, never held her baby girl. I wonder who picked her daughter's Hebrew name, Chaya. I think of this motherless little girl, the grandma I never met when we toast Lakayim at family occasions. According to the Torah, Rivka, Hebrew for Rebecca, was the second matriarch of the Jewish people. In the Song of Songs, Rivka is described, quote, as a rose among the thorns, so is my beloved among the daughters." Unquote. The name Rivka comes from the Hebrew ribque, tie firmly, connection, a link, although some scholars have translated it as bind, trap, snare. In a book of biblical names, Rivka means knotted cord, so many threaded lives to unravel. Of course, I never knew Rivka, nor did I know my grandmother, Edith, who died of ovarian cancer at 41. 
The next poem explores the theme of inheritance and the things we inherit beyond our genes. Handmade. Upward stroke of a sable brush. My mother painted rouge just below her cheekbone. Faint of hand makes pale cheeks blush. Dabbing perfume drops with pointer finger twice behind each ear, the way her mother taught her. My grandmother's sepia portrait always in place on my mother's dressing table, altar of intimacy. I never knew her. I know her face as I know my face. Owner of the brass menorah, keeper of the family flame, I imagine my grandmother's hands gathering Sabbath light, her first name, my middle name. When I wear perfume for an evening out, I dab with my pointer finger twice behind each ear. What's in a name? I never knew her. While the first section of the book centers on two women in my family that I never knew, the second section centers on my mother and my aunt who profoundly influenced my growing up and many choices I made. The next poem describes an experience from my adolescence, a time of shadows, foreshadowing. Elegy for the French leather wallet. You cannot consider yourself a New Yorker unless you have traveled the Seventh Avenue subway, unless you know what it's like to stand so close to others, you can hear people popping gum inside their mouths, unless you know how to grab the straps without losing your balance, without breathing until the next stop. You cannot consider yourself a New Yorker unless you have visited the Met on a Sunday afternoon to admire the collection of Egyptian art the reconstructed temple of Dender, the tomb of the female pharaoh Hatshepsut. She wore a false beard to assert her authority. You were scared to look directly into that slim opening in the stone facade to view the sarcophagus holding the queen's body because she might not be dead. She might be alive eating the food they packed for her in case she got hungry ever. You know you are a New Yorker when you lose something personal, something valuable on the subway by mistake, or maybe it was stolen. You were never quite sure whether it was your fault, the time you lost your wallet, the one your mother bought you on her spring trip to Paris after her second surgery, the one she picked out for you because of the vermilion leather exterior, because you exclaimed red, as your favorite color at age three. You didn't discover the wallet was gone until you reached for your keys, until you were greeted by Frank, the balding doorman, who repeated at every opportunity, I knew you when you were just a bit of a thing and now here you are wearing stockings and heels. You told him what happened, what you thought happened. He tried to console, but you already knew. You would never find another French leather wallet so beautiful, so vermilion. I'm going to read several poems now that explore, they're part of a series actually, I'm just going to read three of them that explore memories of my mother's illness. And these poems puncture that silence I spoke about earlier by saying what was unspeakable in my family. Rock, paper, scissors. Malignant, not benign. Lymph nodes already invaded the start of a war she never enlisted. The surgeon failed to find clean margins as though she had transgressed, written outside the lines of her life. At 13, no one I knew had breast cancer. Her first Sunday morning home from the hospital, she told me what they had done to her. Doctors do things like that. Short sentences, jagged pauses, deep breaths. I was numb, she was 41. Alone, scanning a catalog from Saks, staring at shapely young women modeling black and white brassieres, wondering if mine were big enough. I grabbed a scissors from my desk drawer, cut out their breasts, 
one by one, page after page. Bare branches. There is a problem with my mother's breathing, a cavity between lung and membrane filling up with fluid. My father is measured, words rehearsed, trapped between medical knowledge and desperation. He cannot lie about anatomical vocation, cannot name its cause, its culmination. Late September, green leaves turn to gold, resign to brown, fall to the ground, temperatures dropping, daylight fading. In an autumn photo, she stands by the edge of the pond at our country house, tree branches bare, her body at an angle. She chooses not to face the camera. She has reached the final stage. Shadows flicker, her face, her neck. It is the only black and white photograph I have of her. Lost in Central Park. After my mother died, I could not say the word dead. I had not seen her die. It was possible she was still alive, maybe hiding, unlike her, traveling abroad, she would have told me. Had she wandered out of the hospital, gotten lost in Central Park? She could not have walked out. The last time I saw her legs, they were not my mother's legs. Muscles atrophied, small bundle of bones loosely wrapped in a sagging skin sack. I saw them by accident. Her blanket slipped before the nurse could catch it. So thin like twigs you could break with your bare hands. After she died, I tried to see her face, but all I could see were her chicken bone legs. They followed me everywhere I went. The second half of the book focuses on transforming grief, fighting fear and living. As poet Ellen Bass says, quote, all art is holding the tension between elegy and ode, between our sorrows, despairs, and sufferings, and the praise, wonder, and awe that we feel. I'm going to share two poems that engage in praise and wonder. Constellations. Orion's belt shines in three-point precision as we huddle, eyes raised in the frigid crystalline air. Even the Pleiades have shed their hazy filaments, rejoined the company of breathing lights. Clearness is not about seeing. I want to lie with you, folded, silent, barely sleeping. I want the glow of meteors to course through our veins, the slow reflected glory of light years to extend our time. Hold me again as on a February night by Provincetown Harbor, fill the sky with Latin names, animal heads, gods and ghosts. Undress me with assurance, make the surface of my skin a celestial map, one unknown sun discovered. This poem is called Hiking the Mountains of Moab, and the epigraph reads Grand Junction, Colorado. A woman alone in the desert, a familiar fear, brush away cobwebs of what if. The trail is steep, muscles in my legs begin to ache. I am walking, working, climbing. Without warning, a loud sound, large rocks falling, a change in the weather, sleeping boulders grinding together. I cannot name it. I cannot quell the urge to label it, to claim it. The path, path curves and slivers. Tiny wildflowers nestle in rock crevices, fuchsia and white, deep red, blood orange. I pretend the palette of petals relieves the tightness in my chest. I continue to climb. In my mind, I am turning back. In my heart, I am moving forward to find the fossilized plants, discover the dinosaur bones, peer into pits where archaeologists labored. 
A large lizard darts across my path. The tightness in my chest moves down my legs. Ascending onto a flat rock, the lizard ignores my presence. Pink tongue licks the air. Colors pull me closer. Skin bright turquoise, neck encircled in black, head crowned in gold. My heart pounds. The lizard's belly moves rhythmically in, out, in, out. The lizard's breathing, my own breathing, the quickening of awe, Baruch Atah. And I'm going to close with a poem that weaves together elegy and ode and expresses my faith in trees as vessels of repair for our broken world. It's called Hymn to be Sung at Astronomical Twilight. Lichen, all that remains green, clings to the naked stump. One piece of bark lingers in the dirt. Survive the shredding only to be trapped between decay and salvation. I heard it howl when they split the trunk into billets, heard the crass conquering laughter of the hatchet men when they first saw the wet sapwood in the middle, you'd think they'd discovered America. But you and I know that tree had no more chance of living among the rotting flesh of humans and mammals or the ancient underbellies of sea creatures than any of us. If you think it's hard to make out shapes and scents from decaying dirt, then wait till your eyes are used to the dark. You will see animal hearts and the skins of ghosts. You will see tender shoots and saplings a grove of saplings, like far off stars, waiting to be born, waiting for the light. Thank you. Thank you, Anne. That was a beautiful and very powerful. Um, so our, our next reader is Jennifer Martelli. She is the author of The Queen of Queens and my Tarantella, named a must read by the Mass Center for the Book. Her work has appeared in Poetry, the Academy of American Poets, Poem a Day, Thrush, and elsewhere. She has twice received grants for poetry from the Mass Cultural Council, and she is co-poetry editor for Mom Ake Review, and I give you Jennifer. Thank you so much, Gloria, um, and congratulations on this uh, milestone. You do so much for the poetry community. Uh, you give so much, and I, I'm really honored to be reading here. And Anne, thank you so much um, for reading those beautiful poems. Um, they, they were the language and the emotion are just um, very, very moving, very moving. Um, so yeah, I, uh, and I think you were much more articulate than I will be. Um, I've been alternating between crying and screaming over the past few years. And if I start doing that uh, during this reading, just go on without me. Um, I'm gonna be reading from The Queen of Queens, which is my uh, latest book. Uh, and this centers around Geraldine Ferraro, who was uh, the vice presidential nominee in 1984. Um, she was a, um, an Italian American woman, uh, strong pro-choice stance. Um, so she faced a lot of backlash, uh, for many reasons, uh, but, uh, from the Italian American community and, and, and the Catholic community also. Um, and if I have time, I'm going to read from my forthcoming, a couple, just a couple of poems from my forthcoming chapbook. Uh, this first poem um, has an epigraph by, uh, from Geraldine Ferraro. I didn't expect the majority of the Italian American community to abandon me in their silence. At the corner of Asunta and Camille Roads, Revere, Massachusetts. A small gray pregnant cat was lifted by the talons of a hawk. The brown and white bird carried its prey past the overgrown blue fur and the afternoon moon, which loomed like Mary's breast pressed against the sky window. 
As the cat flew, she watched the low pitch roofs of the new ranches, the dugout foundations, homes she would never live in. The moon surrendered itself to this tableau. The gray cat, the hawk that had never been seen before in this neighborhood, all the hunger. Weeks earlier, some boys caught that golden black snake dangling deep with, within the blue firs branches. She would visit from the dug up pond where the houses would go. They chased her until she wore out from reticulation, her long spine unable to move quick like brain waves in a dream. I can barely write this. The boys looped her into a brown lunch bag, doused it with gas, lit it on fire. The cat did not see this and the hawk, alighting by the muddy pond, released her. She stepped from under its wing, uncertain. I still don't know if this was a dream or a memory. The cat, the black and gold snake, there was charred skin, there were tire strips, there was a laboring cat, the whole neighborhood, nascent, silent. When was my anger conceived? The summer of assassinations by the man-made lake, a hole so shallow and muddy, all the men held hands, formed a human net and walked toward each other to the center to feel for some kid who might have gone under there on its shore in the Kodak, me in my little terry cloth bikini, all round as the moon's stomach. I'd worn a Batman mask attached by a thin rubber band all summer. My hands fisted, the nails bit crescents in my palms. The summer of my monarchy, against the lazy Susan in the kitchen, I stood watching the president resign on the small TV. I cried because of the cramps and blood, the garter belt biting me. My mother said, we'd never see this again, and she was wrong. Even married to my father, she couldn't predict the depth of a man's rage. The summer of my first abortion, the clinic three stops down from my dorm, three quick stops on the green line, and no one shot there yet but escorts needed, one pink set of rosaries flung in my face. That year, 1984, my aunt said she wouldn't vote for anything that menstruated, could get pregnant, could bear a child. So um, I'm going to read a poem that was an attempt at humor, which I'm not good at in poetry. Um, in an interview, Geraldine Ferraro was misquoted um, as saying, he is my man, he is my tomato, which is ridiculous. Uh, so I, I, I wondered what questions would have been asked to have made that answer make sense. So he is my man, he is my tomato. Why haven't you taken your husband's name? What is a love apple? Has he paid his taxes? What fruit is not native to Italy? Who is Luca Brazzi, John Gotti, Vinnie Barbarina? What is a beefsteak, a San Marzano, a black crimp? Does your husband also support the murder of babies? What fruit has meat and skin and bleeds? Has your husband ever killed a man, rented a room to a pornographer? What would you like on your burger? What fruit's bitterness is neutralized with sugar? What of your father? What of your husband's father? How did he die? What fruit was too cold, too wet for the Italians to eat raw? What does your God look like, your priest, your Pope? What is an early girl, a tigerella, three sisters? It 
it started out funny, but it didn't end that way. <laughs> Succulent. I, I want to fill a bay window with 16 jade plants in terracotta pots until they grow thick and knotted as snakes tangling in the hair of a woman raped by a god and punished by a woman. I want to tease rubbery pearl beads of asters into a rosary string, finger them, prey on them, try not to let the toxins seep onto my skin. I want to snap off a fat oozy leaf of the aloe I kept in the middle of my blue table, rub the silm on my scalded hands. I want to grow the round black and shiny phyllotaca on a high shelf away from my Maria, my long haired cat, hide them from pregnant women who want to keep their babies from bleeding out. I always seem to want too much. I want my succulents to survive me. They can live for a long time without water, without touch. So I wrote a love sonnet to, to Nancy Pelosi, as one should. Uh, this is really an American sonnet. Um, each line has 17 syllables. So, um, you know, like a, a stretched out haiku. Um, there is a quote, a few words that I quoted uh, from Pelosi uh, when she was describing the nomination of Geraldine Ferraro, and I'll do the quotes now. Nancy Pelosi's beads, 1984 to the present. She wore eye of the tiger, thrill of the fight, orange striped beads, they shone. Her tiger eye shone, even in the photos, they shone like a wet pelt. Tahitian South Sea pearls, spectacular, emotional, thunderous. Sky blue and gold, sky blue and gold, sky blue and gold, sky blue and gold clasped. How we see the past from the future, gold snake eggs in an owl's beak. In the 80s, we all looked like little men with big shoulder pads. Pelosi's be beads so dark, they reflected how endless and orbital. I like a story that turns on itself like a wounded animal, a story that curves the way a spine curves, licks itself clean, scented, whole. Careless folk confused her mace with the caduceus. She's not here to heal. The mace she pinned to her breast held a pearl atop 13 bound gold rods. Pelosi's jade beads, Easter egg yellow beads, chaste beads, torqued her throat. Her, her Marikita Masterson beads, blue black gumballs to choke a horse. She wore them around her neck like war trophies clasped with two thick red hooks. So an interesting tidbit uh, from the New York Times, um, the words anger, hangnail, and angina all have the same root. They all come from the same word, which they think is Germanic, and it, it has something to do with constriction, uh, which I found fascinating. I mean, hangnail, who, who would have thought that? Uh, I wrote this poem during, you know, the thick of the pandemic, and um, I think from washing my hands so much and being inside, uh, my, my hands were so rough and my fingernails were practically breaking off. I just remember that, for some reason, that, that sticks out. Root. I bought a new knife, sliced an onion through its skin, through its 16 layers. I was Sylvian and Plathian. I sliced close to the nail bed of my left ring finger, low to the lanula. This is my winter of hangnails and split nails. I spit nails, 
crescent moons fly out of my mouth and across the maple wood floor and little white knives of cartilage sprout still hinge to my skin, catch on my gray wool wrap. The root of anger is the kissing cousin of hangnail. Today, I learned that pearls without cores make the ideal sculpting medium if you were to sculpt skulls, the skins don't crack or peel. I can never wed again. The kissing cousin of anger is angina, a stab wound to my sacred heart, the one wound with wire. My grandma said, if we swallowed seeds from a fruit, we'd grow that tree in our stomachs. If we swallowed the fingernails we chewed off, our tummies would be torn open by the claws we grew. Uh, and then I, I'm going to read two more from this book and then one, if there's time, Gloria, from, uh, from my chap, okay. Agridolce, that's a kind of sauce. Um, it's sweet and sour at the same time. Agridolce. The whole world skewed on its iron axis. I ate a lemon from the groves on the coast of Campania, citrus so big, I cupped it in my heart. I cupped it like a heart in my two lined palms, sunk my teeth into sweet pulp. Can you feel the juice as I say this? Can you feel it in your jaws, hinges, in your ears? Deep inside those warm canals, there's an anvil forging sounds, meanings hammered out. Do you wonder what people are saying about you? Do you wonder if people say anything at all? At some point, we all disappear. I had the Strega read my right hand lifeline. It crossed my thumb mound and circled my wrist like a healing wound. This is a plot as well. I asked her to read what was on my left. You are unable to avoid what you wish to. I swallowed the soft bodies of oysters that same oracular night. Their shells told a story too, a landscape. Their bodies tasted like a blue green ocean, like a woman taken whole into my body. So I keep reading this poem and I, I, I wish that, I don't know, it, it, it didn't make sense anymore, but ugh. Um, this again has, a, um, has an epigraph. Uh, the, the Catholic church is or is not monolithic in its teachings on abortion. Uh, and that was by Geraldine Ferraro in 1984. Questions to the electorate. Is a man a monolith? Can you decorate a monolith with sprigs of nutmeg, rue, pennyroyal, a garden of abortifacients? Can you grow savin, squills, ergot of rye around the monolith? Can you dig down far enough so the roots will embed? Can I rule as a monolith? Can I rule as a woman who's not had one but two two abortions and is still not sad? Can I rule as a woman who is not sad at all? Can we drape the monolith with pearls, chunky fake gems? Can we polish its flat, dark marble surface until it shines like the tombstones in the Italian cemetery? Will you circle the monolith? Will you join hands with me and dance and dance and dance? And I'll end with two poems from my, um, from my chapbook, uh, which will be out in October from Harbor Editions. Um, and the name of it is, uh, All Things Are Born to Change Their Shapes, which is a line from Ovid. America as a gigantic woman lay spread eagle on the sidewalk, bleeding out state after state, airless blue, deep red. The men will come with chalk to trace her shape. Three times the country screamed. The first scream, an old car's shrill brakes. 
the second a lover spat, but the country knew the man who slapped her around. Perhaps she asked for it. Third, could have been a dog in heat or in want. Honest to God, it could have been stopped. Rain, storm after rain, storm, barely washed the blood off this crime scene, off the hot top, off the granite, off the pitch. And then this last poem is a persona poem, which I don't write a lot. Uh, go, um, do, when um, Paul Manafort was arrested, they were, um, they had like all these clothes that he was trying to sell and they, they were just like hanging up, like, like as if he were selling them on Craigslist or something. It's just so odd and random. Ghost of the Python killed to make Paul Manafort's jacket speaks. I too began in a womb, coiled like a stove burner, got all sexy with my diamonds and my pearl belly, got all hungry, got all in love, choked the throat of a breathing thing with a long spine and crawled up from my warm hibernaculum. My babies were born and left alive as babies. And I was so gigantic, the reptile butchers, the leather workers, the jacket makers only needed one of me. Oh, how I would have loved to envelop him. Me, fork tongue one, snake, but really you can't split hairs these days. So now I'm a convictor. See me in the bad eBay photo. See how I dangle all unzipped from a dry cleaner's wire hanger, hooked on the jam of a white cross and Bible door. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, such powerful work. Both of you um, are definitely so courageous, brave, beautiful work, and just wonderful. And I am floored by your reading tonight. So thank you so much for being here and reading.